knowing where price is going to go, that's your number one goal. Because everything else outside of that is going to get you in trouble. Order blocks, fair value gaps, all those things, if you don't have the direction right, and that doesn't mean bias, okay? It doesn't mean bias. It means where's the next draw on liquidity because you can trade without a bias. Once you understand what you're looking for in the aspects of time of day and when certain macros come in, and again, a macro is knowing where the market's likely to draw to next with liquidity and the time. So you have, to, you have to know really what you're looking for, for liquidity, and who's been making money right now. That's essentially what the macros do. They roll against who's in the money right now. That's, that's what their, their function is. Because whatever movement in price action that's been unfolding is of recent, whether it be a one-minute chart, a five-minute chart, 15-minute chart, whatever, at specific times of the day, and I, yes, I will teach you these macros, okay? I know it seems like I'm not trying to do it. I am, but I'm teaching you other things that will help you when I do the lecture. You want to be mindful of certain things that I'm talking about in the daily range, the weekly range, and how these intermarket relationships tie together at certain times of the day. When you understand those things, and then I introduce the macros and explain to you what they are, why they form, what their purposes are, it will make perfect sense to you. And you'll anticipate these things happening in the market. You'll, you'll know exactly what is going to most likely occur at that interval right now. In a 20-minute span, you know that there's going to be a setup for me. You could set your watch to it. You can sleep in and say, okay, I don't care about anything else. I'm going to go right in there. I'm going to trade based on what I see within that 20-minute window. And then find your five-handle, ten-handle move. Turn off your charts and go back to doing whatever you want to do. And folks, nobody teaches like that. They want you to follow these moving average crossovers and trend lines and all this other stuff. See, we're below the opening range. Gap's low, see that? So now our attention goes to the new week opening gap high. But if we have a target and we know where the inception of a price move should form, which was, again, at the high of this opening range gap high, remember I was mentioning, I said it could, it would be permissible for it to spike up into here. That would be fine. It would be better had it done that and then started the break lower because in my opinion, it, we, we would have already been trading at the new week opening gaps high down here by now if it would have ran up and took that high. But it's not necessary. So if you were trading this, you would have to trade with leverage going short at the opening range gap high, but allowing for a run above this high here and this high here, which can be scary. Or you would wait for it, had it done so, if it would have spiked up there and broke down, you would wait for the standard fair value gap to, to go short inside of and then ride it down to the opening range gap low and potentially if it goes lower down into the new week opening gaps high. When we were, when we were here consolidating like this, some of you probably thought this dropped down here and said, oh, it's got a pin bar. Oh, look, it's, it's going up. And you were thinking it's going to reverse and go back up and fill this gap. You know who you are. You were hoping it was going to do that because I said it was a measuring gap. I taught you what a measuring gap is now. Inception of the move here. Terminus. Halfway, right in here. Where's the gap? Right there. What kind of gaps are going to be? Measuring gap. Measuring gaps don't fill. Just like breakaway gaps don't fill. But what happens if you do get a measuring gap and it happens to trade up and fill in? Doesn't matter. I'll still treat it the same way. So see, that, see what I just did there? How do you know when a measuring gap forms? I just taught it to you. You have to know where the beginning of a move happens, which I explained to you here. Where is it drawing to? Well, you have a couple things you got to look for. I told you the 39.85 level was the fair value gap, and we have to see how we trade there. Well, it traded down into the 39.85, then consolidated, broke lower, traded to the low of the opening range gap, low, rallied a little bit, consolidation leading to what? This is when your classic continuation patterns work. This is a bear flag. 
But I also teach when those flags are fake and you can fade them where other traders would be caught offside. That's what's in my core content. So when I'm teaching you and I'm trying to give you all of this you know, experience that I have, it's for you to understand what your mind should gravitate towards when you're feeling scared about holding on to the idea that you're in. Watch the consequent encroachment now here. It's this level here. It's the midpoint between this week's current new week opening gap. But you, you, if you don't have the, any experience and you're in the trade, I mean, you know what it's like. You, you probably got lucky enough to get a funded account challenge passed or you had a live account that you opened up prematurely and you put on a trade and you think you know what you're doing and then all of a sudden you can't breathe. The market's not moving for you. You're not, you're not stopped out, but you start guessing what's going to happen next. Am I going to get stopped out? Is it going to turn against me? What is normal? You don't know that. Why? Because you've not done what I'm doing with you here this year. That's exactly why my students that paid me fail. They're lazy. You don't want to be a lazy student. You have to be doing these types of things. I'm out here publicly proving that these things work. So we've traded into buy side. We went into three premium arrays on dollar. We took out three lows on ES, which is... Well, we did not take out three lows. We made three lower lows. We had this low, this low, which was lower than that one, and then we had this low here. This low falls short of the new week opening gap low. At the same time, we made low, lower, lower low. The dollar index has made its run up into three premium arrays. It's the high on your 15-minute candle, of DXY dollar on the 4.45 from Wednesday, 4.45 p.m. That comes in at the 102.58 level. There's buy side there. Then to the right of that high on the 15-minute time frame for dollar index. And I know this part aggravates some of you. Like, can you just show the chart? No, you need to do this while you're watching because I'm looking at it just like you are. And you're going to be doing this on your own anyway. But then the gaps that are in the 7.30 and 6 o'clock from Wednesday, those actual gaps there, uh, that's a liquidity void, a real liquidity void. There's a premium rate there relative to what we were talking earlier. And then we have the highs formed at the 8.45 low. I'm sorry, 8.45 time window this morning, which comes in at the high on, this is a 15-minute time frame again on dollar. That is 102.4. Four, five. Okay, so we went through three premium arrays and we took out one, two, three lower lows and look at the price reaction here. So if you have three elements of liquidity tapped into and you're seeing a low form at a logical level, which was what? Consequent encroachment. Then we have the lower low, the body's respecting consequent encouragement. The market drops again, taking out that low here, and with dollar index, trading into three premium arrays. What's likely to occur? There you go, retracement. What time is it likely to occur? Going into the three o'clock hour, you have what? This macro unfolding here. What's it reaching back up into? New week opening gap. I'm sorry, <laughs> opening range gap. And right in here, remember I was earlier referring to this area here where it could, it could trade up into that and then go lower and it was permissible. That liquidity right now is where all trailed stop losses are. This one has already been taken out, but it's also here now. So make sure this high here on this candle at 4,000, that's noted. So nothing's a surprise, okay? Not, time elements and how many times we go into a area of liquidity. If it's not a run on stops, like as I was mentioning with the dollar index. Let me just show you the dollar index. Thank you, Jesus, right? <laughs> Man. All right. 
15 minute time frame. All right, so here's that high here I mentioned earlier, the 445 high. We traded through that here. This is that void where there's no trading at all. It has one little tick in here. Okay, that's a void. That's a real, absolute, actual liquidity void. There's no trading in there except for that one print there. This and here, and then the high here. So when we were down here, I said we were going to gravitate to here, and then if it goes higher, it can go up into this void, and then this high. We rally up. Cleared all three of them, and at the same time, ES trades down into the old low here, new week gap, new week opening gap rather high, consequent encroachment, failed to go to the low. What level is this? What level is that? Remember what I was teaching you about inefficiencies? Yes, the 50% is consequent encroachment, but you also have two other gradients, 75% and 25%. So it went down to 25 plus a tick or two to allow that print to be there because there's a difference between bid and ask. And then we had this rally back up. What did it reach up into? What is this? Let me take this off because we don't need that now. What is that? Sibby. Trades up into consequent correction of the wick. Hits it, complete repricing back up into all of this. What was inefficient here? Buy side. Why? Because it's a down close candle, it's large to the downside. So it's not offering what efficiently? Buy side. How does it offer buy side efficiently? Price has to go back up through this high to that low, offering movement to the upside. That's repricing over top of sell side delivery, but it's inefficient in the form of buy side. So remember that bank, uh, not bank, but that uh, paint roller analogy I use where you put paint on the roller, put it on the wall. As soon as you put the roller on the wall, the paint distribution is very thick, it's ample. But as you roll it more and more, it starts to create these little pockets of where paint didn't make its way to the wall. And you have to roll back over top of that. The same thing's happening here. It goes down. But in that movement down, there's going to be small little pockets of inefficiency that you don't see. What, how does that, what does it look like? Well, if we do this. If you are finding this helpful, I would greatly appreciate it if you would give me a thumbs up because that's an encouragement to me as a mentor that you're learning from what it is I'm uh, teaching and sharing with you. But we're going to look in this down move here, right there. And I'm going to take this little annotation out. All right, what time frame are we on right now? We're on a 15 minute time frame. So we're going to drop down to a five. We can see that range here. We're going to drop down into a one minute. Inside of that range here, all of this in here, what do you see? I'll make it a little bit bigger so you can see. In this movement, here, what do you see in terms of inefficiency? Remember, that shaded area is a big down closed candle. So it's a fair value gap, SIBI, S-I-B-I, sell side imbalance, buy side inefficiency. So what is it missing? Efficient delivery for buy side. So inside of this shaded area, I want you to look real close. Where are the inefficiencies? Here. 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 And a volume imbalance right there. See that? So if we take this level here, let's see if I can copy that. There's your volume imbalance, high, right there. Market trades up into it. It has to do what? It has to go a little bit past it for what? Efficient delivery, because there's a difference between the bid and the ask. So to get that price, 
it's got to go one tick at least above it, right? Well, you're getting that there. Trade's there, and then we came off, back off of it. So inside of these inefficiencies, you have to drill down into the smaller time frames. And in fact, I'm not going to do it here, but if you have the benefit of using the 30 minute and 15 and 5 second time frames, you can actually look at this even better, like a microscope zooming in. You remember in science or biology when you were in school, and it gave you those things to look at on a Petri dish, and you zoom in? Well, the same thing you're doing here. You're zooming into that, and you're going to target the actual inefficiency, so how far these price runs can pull back up into it. What's occurring at 3 o'clock that causes this? Like, wh why does that happen? The bond market's closing. So the bond market's closing has this impact on equities. Sometimes it creates continuation. Sometimes it creates a reversal. Sometimes it creates a retracement and then continuation. You have to know what you're looking for, where you are in the grand scheme of things in the higher time frame chart, and what is still left to be taken in terms of liquidity or trade to inefficiency.